The S&P 500 might be the single most famous index in the world that even some of the best investors struggle to beat. But are we missing something with a much bigger world out there? And is it better to invest in a global index fund or stick to something like the S&P 500 for the rest of our investing lives? And that's exactly what I want to answer for you in today's video. And we're going to have a face off between the S&P 500 and a global index fund where just like the old card game top trumps, remember them, we're going to compare all of the stats, the numbers, the performance, and then in the end, try and figure out which one you might want to pick over the other. And spoiler alert, I don't think it's as simple or as straightforward as you might think. But let me explain why. And let's take a look at our contenders. So let's look at the high level stats first and then dive into these a little deeper. I'm sure most of you will be already very familiar with the S&P 500. It's been around since 1957 and represents the biggest companies based in the US. And as the name gives up, has around 500 companies inside, although some companies have double listings, which is why you'll see more than 500 stocks inside your favorite S&P 500 index fund. There's all the big household names and big tech players like Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. And even those companies alone we're talking trillions of dollars worth of market cap, which is miles bigger than almost every stock market in the world. Now, on that note, in a global index fund, let's take something like the FTSE All World Index. We still get all of those companies that we just mentioned and a lot more. So if we're just comparing the number of companies, here is where a global index fund clearly stands out. Currently, the FTSE Global Index has more than 3,600 companies in it. And as you can see on screen, all of the big names are there at the top. But as you start to go through each page, you start to find companies based outside the US like Taiwan Semiconductor, Nestle, and then Tencent. But here's the big question. Does it really matter that there's more than 3,500 stocks on this list? And do you really need that many? Or are you just overcomplicating things and diversifying too much? It's not as simple as saying, I've got more stocks than you, I win. At the end of the day, it's all about performance, right? So let's talk performance first, before we actually go back to the topic about the number of stocks, because I do think there's a lesson in there somewhere. Now, let's use our trusty portfolio backtesting tool and try and see what would have happened to our investments if we started around 10 years ago. Let's put these things up head to head with the S&P 500 and a global index fund. We'll reinvest all our dividends. We'll say we're a regular investor. We put in $500 or pounds every single month. I do wish we could go a little bit back further in history, but there aren't many global index funds. So we'll just have to go back until 2009. But to be honest, what a good time that would have been to start investing. And with the snap of the fingers, here are the results. The S&P 500 investor ends up with over 226,000. And unfortunately, the global investor misses out and ends up with just 165,000. Hmm not quite so good. So size doesn't matter then? However, I don't want to rain in our parade and spoil the fun, but that is just the past. We've been through an incredible bull market where big tech and massive companies have performed amazingly well. What we're interested in now is the future. And as you should already know by now, nobody knows the future, although plenty of people claim to know what's coming. And it's always fun to see what Robert Kiyosaki is predicting this week. Right then, so what about the future? Here's where numbers matter, I think and we need to sit down and have the talk. No, not that kind of talk, the diversification talk. You see, the S&P 500 is definitely well diversified. You've got companies from all kinds of industries who sell all over the world from big tech to pharmaceutical to big industry and oil. And over the years, the index has changed as old companies slowly die and the new ones rush in to fill the spaces. However, there is a really big concentration of those massive companies now right at the top who make up such a big part of the index. Check this out. If we look at the current weight of the biggest holdings in the S&P 500 index fund, we get Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, and so on. And the top 10 make up 27% of the whole fund. So for every $100 you have invested, that's almost a whole third of it stuck into some already big names. Compare that to a global index fund now, and the top 10 only makes up 15%. So by going down the global route, you really are getting a lot more diversification. Also, in terms of sectors, this is really interesting as well. Check out the differences here between the S&P 500 and the FTSE Global Index Fund. As you can see, because the S&P 500 is so tech dominated, you have a lot of your wealth tied up in an already massive companies. And also, notice how the order of the industries changes in the global fund. It's not quite the same, and you do get more in certain sectors like industrials and financials. You could say that with the S&P 500, you might be missing out on some of the growth that happens in some of these areas. But hey, 
we don't know what's next. However, one thing I do know is that it massively helps out the channel if you do enjoy videos like this to hit the like button for me, make sure you subscribe, and also let me know in the comments if you're going global or just S&P 500. Now, I did say we don't know the future, so there's no way of telling if an investment in the S&P 500 right now or a global index fund will do better over the next 10, 20, or even 30 years. But I do think it's at least worth thinking about. If anything, I hope we've learned over the past three years or so how quickly things can change in the world as we go from international supply chains with just-in-time delivery to trade wars to actual wars and pretty much everything else in between. For all we know, the next 20 years could be really good for international stocks outside the US as, let's face it, the US market is so popular, so well known, and surely everything has been priced in and gets all of the attention already. The S&P 500 is kind of like an all-American beauty queen, elegant, great on camera, has all the right things to say, whereas international stocks have for the most part been left on the side and only get brought out now and then to get some sunlight. And unfortunately, they sound a bit like this. I think she said France. Anyway, just remember that stocks outside the US have, during some time periods, performed better than the US market and the S&P 500. I've used this chart before in some of my other videos, but it's always worth bringing this one up again and again. It shows how, over certain years, international stocks have beaten out US stocks. So every time these blue bars are above the middle line, it means that the US has beaten international. And then every time the blue lines are below, it means that international has won. Now, as you can see, we've kind of gone in a cycle over many decades. So are we maybe due for another cycle where the US stocks outperform for a while? I'm not sure at all, but it's just another reminder that there's a bigger world out there now and there's plenty of other companies out there that could make it big that nobody right now is even aware of. A new investor starting today going to have another great run of US stocks in the S&P 500 leading the way, or are those blue bars about to flip to the other side as other stock markets around the world start to get more attention? Lots of food for thought. Right, next on the trump cards, we need to talk about the good old US dollar and currency exchange rates. If you're based in the US, invest in the US stock market, you obviously use the dollar, a currency that as of today, makes up almost 60% of all foreign exchange reserves and more than 80% of global foreign reserve trading. In plain English, that means that the dollar is king. Now, why does that matter? Well, because almost everything that drives the economy is traded with the dollar. In order to buy these things, we need to take our own currency and buy some, which puts many of us outside the US in an interesting position. Now, as the demand for dollars changes every day, we're pretty much at the mercy of that exchange rate. So here in the UK, our pound might be weak or strong at any point. Remember when last year the pound got absolutely smashed against the dollar because of good old Liz Truss? Yes, she was prime minister for a couple of weeks. And at times like that, it makes everything we buy in dollars more expensive, including our own investments. It's nice if you need to sell some stocks because you get a bit more, but they're not so great for building wealth because it costs you a bit more as well. Now, over the long term, things you'd hope would even out. If you buy regularly and invest as often as you can, sometimes you'll get a good price and other times you'll get a more expensive one. But what if at the point where you want to retire and start selling your stocks, the exchange rate sucks? Well, there might not be much you can do, which is another good reason to really think about a global index fund where there's a bit more of a mix of currencies and you're less hooked on the dollar. Also, although I won't talk about it here, I know some people are a fan of using the hedged approach, but then there's also risk with that as well. One thing worth saying is that, let's say you're a UK investor like most of my audience and me, even if you're stuck to the UK-based companies, you still can't really escape the dollar completely because so many things that those companies need to function are traded using the dollar unless you can only invest in some kind of business that can magically create energy, oil, lumber, coffee, gold, and almost anything else you can imagine, they'll still be affected by those exchange rates at some point. So there's not too much you can do other than I would say, probably think about diversifying to a few more currencies and at least have a bit of stake in the pound as well, which is exactly where a global index fund comes in. If you don't want to spend more than a second thinking about global currency exchange rates, then honestly, I can't blame you. So leave that to the market and just focus on investing, as all we know is things can get very complicated very easily. Okay, on the trump cards next, let's talk valuations. This is a hot potato topic because you'll always find some people who claim that the S&P 500 is way too overvalued. So this is why they pick individual stocks, blah, blah, blah. So let's just quickly address this issue and work out if this really matters. Let me bring up the long-term PE ratio for the S&P 500, which in theory gives us a good overview of how cheap or expensive the stock market is in relation to its past. It's worth saying that technically this isn't all the S&P 500 as the index only came about in 1957, but let's just take this as the whole US stock market either way. 
Right now, the PE ratio is 23.68, as you can see. And if we just look back at long-term history, I'm sure you'd think that looks pretty expensive right now. So you better not invest and you'll lose all of your money. The long-term average is 16. So we're sat at nearly 24 right now. That's way too pricey. Better go back picking individual stocks because index investing is dead, right? Here's the issue though. While valuations really do matter and the PE ratio could be a good helpful tool, over the long term, we're not comparing the same companies here as over time, the companies inside the index have changed completely. And the world around it looks nothing like the world from only just a few decades ago. I mean, think about it like this for a second. Imagine an S&P 500 that just had big old companies in it that were slow growing, and then compare that to another S&P 500 where all the companies were fast growing tech companies, more than 60% gross profit margins and all of the rest of the stuff that comes along with it. Purely based on that information, you'd have to say that the second one would deserve a higher PE ratio because of the growth and future potential. Well, this is pretty much the same situation we have now where the S&P 500 of today is almost unrecognizable from just a few decades ago. Technology, I think it's fair to say, has changed everything. And although people got a bit carried away in the dot-com boom and we had the same thing happen in the markets before the global financial crash, I'm sure you'd agree that there are much higher quality companies around today that deliver more profits than ever before. So then what do we do as investors and does any of this really tell us what the best index fund is? Here's what I think. Firstly, I think both approaches will probably do really well in the long term and honestly, I wouldn't lose too much sleep if you only have the S&P 500 and nothing else. However, I do think that it really depends on you and also where you invest from. If you're a US investor and live and work in the US and have everything based in dollars, then I think the S&P 500 will be a solid choice for the long term. As you might already know, the majority of active fund managers struggle to beat the S&P 500 most years, and over the long run, they do even worse. So it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. The key thing though, is making sure you invest regularly for the long term and keep buying in good times and bad times. And the only person who can control that is gonna be you. Now, this doesn't mean the global index isn't for US investors, and actually, I think it's just one of those choices you have to make as an investor, what's gonna keep you up at night and who you want to bet on. For us here in the UK, Europe, and the rest of the world, I also think we'll be absolutely fine in a long-term strategy with the S&P 500. But just like I did recently for my own investments, I do think there's a big, wide world out there with lots of great companies, many of which just get ignored because they just aren't that attractive. And don't forget, a global index fund, something like the FTSE All World Index or even the MSCI All World Index, has all of those US companies in as it's always based on market cap anyway. So you don't miss out on all of that growth from the big mega cap tech stocks. From my personal view, I can see that the market moves in cycles as the world changes. We never quite know where we are in that cycle. And the most important thing is to just keep buying and staying in the market. I read a good example the other day about investors who keep changing their strategy, like people driving on the motorway stuck in traffic but they keep changing lanes to just try and get that one or two cars ahead. All that ends up happening to those people is that they end up more and more stressed, more angry, and most of the time, they end up getting overtaken by the slower lanes anyway, as more and more people try and jump into the fast lane. I think index fund investing can be a bit like that. Don't stress yourself out too much on making a decision. And also, you wanna know the best bit? You don't even have to just pick one or the other. You can just do whatever you want. You can make up your own global index fund using different ETFs or you can even just have a global index fund and double up on the S&P 500. It's completely up to you. Welcome to the wonderful world of investing and personal finance. So look, if you buy the whole world regularly, sit back and relax and do this for a really long period of time, you're very likely to do very well. But there's no guarantees ever, and also there's nothing stopping the S&P 500 to continue just to beat the global market over the next few decades. The trick is, I think, to just keep focused on doing it and keep yourself in the market as it's too easy to sell out and get distracted by the next big thing. So for me, I'm mostly global and that's the way things will stay, but you might decide otherwise. Now, if you're here in the UK and you're trying to figure out what to invest in, why not take a look at my latest portfolio update up here, where I've actually made my own global portfolio on Invest Engine platform using different ETFs. Or if you still are yet to make the decision, why not follow this video where I ask the big question, is the S&P 500 all that you really need as an investor? There's more extra points I didn't cover in this video. Anyway, on that note, see you in the next video. And as always, happy investing.